Good morning. On Christmas Day in 1738, a young Christian was walking to church. His name was Charles Wesley. And as he was walking to the church in London, he heard these church bells ringing, and he felt inspired to take out a piece of parchment and his quill and to write down a poem. He wrote these words, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And we, 280 years later, still sing those words at Christmas time. It's a wonderful hymn full of doctrine, and especially in this stanza, it, it captures the mystery of the incarnation. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. In Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah says, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. But in the marvelous texts that we're going to come to today in Matthew 17, 1 to 13, we catch a glimpse of the glory of Christ in the transfiguration. Let us pray now that what was shown to the three disciples, three of Jesus' friends on the mountaintop, would be powerfully conveyed to us by the Holy Spirit through the Word this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love and your grace to us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through the Word, for we could not know who you were unless you gave us your special revelation in the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, so much that you showed your glory to Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop. And I pray that, uh, well, that we would see your glory. Like Moses said, I want to see your glory, Lord. May you be in our vision. May you be the, the centerpiece of our lives. May you turn our hearts now through the Holy Spirit to focus on Christ, on who Christ is, and on what he has done for us, on the love of God displayed, manifested through Jesus Christ. We turn our hearts and our eyes to you. There are so many things in the world that's going on right now, so many things that we could be setting our minds on. But Lord, set our minds on you now. Open up our hearts. Speak to us through your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. The text is Matthew 17, 1 to 13. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come. 
and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. We left off last week with Christ's response to Peter's misunderstanding of both Jesus' mission and his own mission. Jesus explained to all of his disciples that he must suffer and die and be buried and on the third day rise again. And indeed, if they would come after him, they themselves must deny themselves and take up their own crosses and follow him. He showed them in verses 24 to 28 in chapter 16 what true discipleship looks like. And then, six days later, Jesus chose three of the men to lead them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now these particular three men were Jesus' inner circle out of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. These are Jesus' closest friends. It's good to remember that, actually. Jesus is a real human being. Jesus is a real, true human being. He had real friendships with other men. In John 15, 15, Jesus said to his disciples, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. What a remarkable statement that is. That the holy, righteous, infinite Son of God would condescend so far as to call sinners his friends. You are my friends. We may be a friend to Jesus. Incredible. And what is even more remarkable is that his disciples sometimes even strained that friendship. They strained it. They... aggravated Jesus. They did things that, that made him not sinfully frustrated, but in a holy way frustrated. All right, They could not understand. They would not listen. When Jesus is in Gethsemane, he's asking his disciples, stay awake just for a little while and pray for me. Pray with me. They couldn't even do that. But Jesus is so full of grace that even after Peter in verses 22 to 23 uh, takes him aside and rebukes Christ and says to him, this shall never happen to you when Jesus says that he's going to suffer and die. Even after that, Jesus still chooses to bring Peter with him to have this experience with the Christ up on the mountaintop. He shows by example here how true godly friendship endures offense. True godly friendship endures offense. He shows how love is patient and how it keeps no record of wrongs. And he does that by bringing Peter with him on the mountain. Christ could have just disowned Peter or left him with the other disciples at least. But instead he brings him with because he loves him. Jesus loves all of these men. He loves Peter. He desires to reveal himself more fully to him and to them. Oh, how Peter could truly sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And so Jesus journeys up the mountain with his inner circle. And there they got to see the most marvelous sight that any human eyes had ever seen seen. Look at verses 2 and 3. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. 
As these four men were up on the mountain, Jesus was visibly transformed before the eyes of the disciples. He was transfigured. The Greek word metamorpho uh, means literally to change form. Luke says that his appearance was altered. But here, of course, words fall short. All that the inspired authors can do is write in similitudes. His face shone like the sun. His clothes were white as light. His clothes were whiter than anyone could bleach them. It's, these are just like and as words. Me, uh, 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 they can only speak in similes. They can only use metaphors. Because what they saw was beyond human comprehension. It was beyond the capacity of language to convey. Has anyone here ever been to the um, Grand Canyon before? I remember when I went there with my dad and my little brother and one of my dad's friends. We were driving through like a forested area and it seemed to take forever to get there. And it said on the GPS that we were there. And I said, oh, what a disappointment because I couldn't see anything but just trees, <laughs> all right? Like, is there really even a Grand Canyon somewhere over here? Because it says, you have arrived. And there's like nothing. And then suddenly, as the car broke through the forested area, it was like, ah! It was the most spectacular thing that I had ever seen in my life. Absolutely. And I, I took out my can I mean, it, when my dad who's not a Christian, saw the Grand Canyon, the first thing that came out of his mouth was this, there is a God. Incredible, amazing. I took out my phone camera and, and I took some pictures of it. And when I looked at the pictures, they didn't look anything like what I was actually looking at. It fell so far short of what the actual vision was. And even as I describe it now, for those of you who've been here, you know what I'm talking about. It's like awe-inspiring. You see as far as the eye can see, the grand, it puts the grand in Grand Canyon. It's grand sight in front of my eyes, amazing. As far as I can see, and so deep and so wide and far. And even as I describe it, if you've never seen it, or even if you've seen pictures, it still doesn't really do it justice. And, and that's what's going on here. His face shone like the sun. Well, what is that? What does that mean? Well, look at the sun. If you, if you go outside and look at it, you, you, can't even, you can't set your eyes on it. It's too bright. Shining radiance coming from Christ's face, from His clothes, shining through His clothing. Christ was visibly transfigured. His form changed. Metamorpho. Incredible, amazing, marvelous, spectacular. What was going on here? Mark writes, his clothes were radiant, whiter than any man on earth could bleach them. The disciples saw with their eyes what David referred to in Psalm 104, verse 2, the Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. For a time, it was as if the veil was taken away and the glory that Christ had before the foundation of the world was on display at the top of the mountain. What a magnificent experience that must have been for the disciples. To see Christ with their own eyes in that way, that is what Moses wanted to see. I want to see your glory. It was something that they would never forget. John would later write in chapter 1, verse 14 of his gospel, in the same John that's here with Jesus on the mountain, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Peter also wrote about this, but I'll come back to that. There's something else here that I, I want uh, you to see that makes this account all the more wondrous, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 
53, that famous chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, verse 2, speaking of the Messiah who was to come. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. See, Christ the King was not born in a palace. He was born in a manger. He did not live in a castle. Rather, he says, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. His physical appearance was not even beautiful. During his earthly ministry, Jesus looked far more like a peasant than a king. But on that mountain, he was transfigured. And the beauty and majesty of Christ was physically made manifest before these three disciples. And even more, the text says that two other guests appeared with him. Look at verse 3 again. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. The appearance of these two representatives of the law and the prophets both testify to the identity of the one whom they typified and prophesied about. Here, here are, as it were, um, the two witnesses from the Old Testament times who came down from the bosom of Abraham and further confirmed the Messiahship of Jesus. I mean, a as if there needed any more confirmation. As if what Christ has... has uh, for those of you who have been here for 17 chapters of Matthew so far, as if we needed any more confirmation of the identity of Jesus Christ. Here, the, probably the two most recognizable people other than God himself in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, come on top of the mountain and have a conference with Jesus. In fact... This is actually the first time that Moses steps foot in the promised land. Oh, snap. You remember what happened. Moses could not enter the promised land because he disobeyed God. He was buried outside of the promised land. It was Joshua who took the people into the promised land. Moses was buried outside. He never actually got to enter in. You see, Moses even needed Jesus to come into the promised land. Woo, I could preach on that. Even Moses needed Jesus to get to the promised land for what the law could not do. Weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Romans 8.3. What a truly awesome sight the disciples were privy to. What an awesome, I mean awesome in the truest sense of that word. Awesome. Full of awe. To see Peter's reaction in verse 4 is pretty remarkable too. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. <laughs> like, talk about an understatement, all right? It is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Why did Peter say this? Because on that mountaintop was a taste of heaven itself. Heaven. Jesus is there, glorified, shining glory. Moses is there. Elijah is there. The cares of the world are way down there. Peter wants to stay there forever. Who can blame him? It's a heavenly conference on the mountain. Who would ever want to leave? You know, I can honestly say I've even felt something akin to that. Maybe, I think. Here. Here, in this room. 
feeling like I never want to leave. There have been times, and it's not all the time, and you can't manufacture this, but, but there have been times when we've been worshiping together, or even as I've been in this pulpit and preaching the word, where I've felt this such a sense of love and peace from God. I don't want to leave Crossview Church today. I don't want to go outside of the bounds of this place. This is like a taste of heaven for me. I mean, there, and not always, all right? But there have really been times where I've felt that right here, right here. Like this is my family. Even when my blood family is against me, you're my family. You're my family in Christ. And that's a really beautiful thing. I can understand why Peter says, let me build three houses and let's just stay here, Lord. Let's forget about everything and everyone else and just stay here. I want to stay here with you. Luke 9.33 records something really funny. <laughs> Luke says, he did not know what he was talking about. <laughs> Right? Yeah, of course. Of course, because the mission had not yet been completed. All right? There's Peter. Like, Peter opens his mouth all the time and sticks his foot in it. All right? Jesus said he had to go and suffer and die at the hands of wicked men, rise from the, uh, from the dead on the third day. And here's Peter like, Lord, let's forget all of that. I'm going to build you houses right now. Of course, Peter's desire couldn't be fulfilled yet. Eventually, you know, the ironic thing is that Peter would get that desire, but Christ had to die and rise again first. That had to happen. See, Christ's purpose in bringing his disciples there and revealing himself in this way was not so that they could all live on a mountaintop paradise with Jesus and the prophets and just hang out up there while everyone else... I mean, <laughs> I think it's really funny that, that Peter said that because, like, you know, what about the other nine disciples that are down there? Like, let's just leave them, Lord, <laughs> right? You brought us up here, that's totally fine. No, Jesus didn't do that for that reason. Instead, he brought them there to further establish in their minds and through the word of God in our minds, Jesus' identity and authority and beauty and majesty. That's why. That's why he brought them there. And indeed, as if what had already occurred were not enough, God the Father also testifies to these things as well. Look at verses 5 and 6. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. So while Peter was still making his ill-informed comments, this bright cloud, it says, overshadowed them. The Greek word for overshadowed here, uh, epikiziazo, has the connotation of being enveloped in a haze of brilliancy. So there they are, Christ shining forth his glory. And then this cloud, this glorious, shining, bright cloud, envelops the mountain. This hazy mist envelops the mountain and this voice thunders out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Are those words familiar? God the Father said the first part of that phrase at the baptism of Jesus. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, and then God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He adds here, Listen to him! He didn't say that part the first time. He says it now. Why did God the Father say, Listen to him? 
Well, for the same reason that everything in the Bible is written to us. Because they weren't listening to him. They weren't listening. Here he is, the son of the living God, and the disciples weren't listening. Peter wasn't listening. Peter was saying, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let me build tents for you. No, Peter, you're not listening. You're not listening. I already told you what needs to happen. I must go and die and rise again. That is what must happen, not stay up here on the mountain. You're not listening. And so God the Father comes and says, Listen! Listen! See, that's the reason why they were always so confused every time Jesus spoke about his death, because they weren't listening. But friends... So often, we have the same problem. We have trouble listening to what the Lord says. Do you know why many times we have trouble listening to what the Lord says? Because we are not even reading what the Lord says. Because we bring our Bibles to church, maybe, or maybe we just find them in the pew in front of us, and then for the rest of the week, our Bibles sit on the shelf collecting dust. How can we listen to him unless we are actually reading what he says? Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. That's the blessed person, truly. And that we are not just hearers of the word, but even doers of it, too. We have the same problem that Peter and the disciples had. They are, you know, types of all of us. Sometimes we don't listen outside of Sunday morning. Sometimes we don't listen on Sunday morning. Do you listen to Jesus? God the Father is commanding his disciples. He's commanding all of us through the word to listen to Jesus, to know Jesus, to know what he says and to obey it. And so what was their reaction to the cloud and to God's voice? They fell on their faces in utter terror. Now that seems to be a little bit strange, right? Because they didn't fall on their faces in terror when they saw Jesus shining forth in heavenly brilliance and Moses and Elijah show up. They're not on their faces then, but this cloud comes, envelops the mountain, and says, this is my son who I love. Listen to him. And they are down in the dust, face down. Maybe the reason why is because of the context. Where are they right now? They are on top of a mountain with a guy, with Jesus, yes, and with Elijah, but with another guy called Moses. And there was another time when Moses went to the top of a mountain and God spoke at the top of the mountain. And we learn about that in Exodus 20 when God gives the Ten Commandments. Just listen to this. Right after God gives the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 18 to 19. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. They stood far off and said to Moses... You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Don't let God speak to us or we will die. And there's Moses, and then there's this thick cloud which envelops the mountain, and what happens? God starts speaking to them. 
Yes, they fall on their face. They believed like uh, Isaiah did. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Perhaps they were also reminded of Exodus 33.20, where God tells Moses, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. No man can see me and live. That's why when Moses wanted to see the glory of God, God says that he must hide him in the cleft of a rock and put his hand over Moses' face, and Moses could only see the trail of his glory. And yet here they are on the mountain, and there's God speaking audibly to them on top of a mountain with Moses. They feel that they're going to die. Of course they were terrified. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Deuteronomy 4.24, The Lord your God is a consuming fire. Habakkuk 1.13, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Exodus 15.13, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. They were rightfully terrified. So, of course, the disciples fell on their faces at the sound of God's voice. But then something wonderful happens in verses 7 to 8. When the disciples heard this, they, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. To stand before God without Jesus is rightfully terrifying. But with Jesus, we may rise and have no fear. Amen. Without Jesus, there's only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. But with Jesus, we may rise and have no fear. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. See, even Peter, who stuck his foot in his mouth, had reason to be terrified because he knew that he was disobeying what God the Father had said. Listen to him! Lord, I haven't been listening to him. Have mercy on me. But Jesus comes up to his disciples as they're laying prostrate on top of the mountain. They're laying face down. And it says that Jesus touched them. Do you know that word there, Jesus touched them, is the same word used in Matthew 8 when Jesus touches the leper. That was the, the first sermon I ever preached at this church. Jesus touches the leper. The Greek word for touches there is the word hapto. It has the connotation of clasping onto or embracing or caressing, touching in a loving way. Jesus goes over to his disciples who are laying down and he holds them and he says, rise and have no fear. They could only have no fear because of him. Because he takes away their iniquity. Because he washes them totally pure and clean of all their sins. That's how they have no fear. That's why Paul says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ bears it all for his elect, for those whom he loves. Bears it all. They could rise and have no fear. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. 
When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. They no longer saw Moses. They no longer saw Elijah. The cloud had dissipated. The blessed Savior was the one who came up to them. Oh friend, do you know Jesus? Do you love Him? Do you know His love for you? To know Him and to be known by Him is the greatest thing in the world. Moses knew it. Elijah knew it. Do we also know it? Why was Jesus alone after the voice from heaven? Because He is the only begotten Son. He is the only object of worship. He is greater than both Moses and Elijah. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. We're coming near to the end now. Exodus 34. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. Exodus 34, 29 to 35. Exodus 34, 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near and he commanded them that all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the people of Israel what he was commanded. The people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Do you see what happened there? Moses goes in to speak with Almighty God. He comes back reflecting the glory of God even in his face. But when Moses went to speak with God, he reflected God's glory. Christ himself radiated the glory of God. When Moses was glowing, a veil concealed the glory so that they wouldn't see the shining glory reflecting off of Moses' face. But in Jesus, the glory penetrates through his garments. His clothes were shining white because the glory of Christ was shining through them. Moses was God's servant, but Jesus is God's son. Moses was a man who was from the earth, but Jesus is the man from heaven. Amen. That's why he was alone. That's why when the disciples looked up, they only saw him. Yet again, the testimony that Christ, Christ alone, it's all Christ alone. That's why our mission is that Jesus would be the center of our lives. Jesus alone. If Jesus is in the center of your life, the biblical Jesus, and truly, that's what the Christian life is all about. You will be enabled to live for God. You'll be able to overcome sin, to die to sin, and to be vivified and alive to God. If Christ is in you, and you are in Christ, then you have more than anything this world can afford. Give me Jesus. Take everything else. Give me Jesus. Jesus alone. Solus Christus. That's the theme of the Reformation. Christ alone. And then, and the Bible is 
so amazing. It's, 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 it is, I mean, it's probably redundant to say this because I, I say it a lot, but it is the very words of truth. It is the perfect revelation of God. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The, the authors of Scripture were speaking the words that the Holy Spirit gave to them and they recorded them or an amanuensis recorded them for the disciples, the apostles, you know. One of the reasons why I believe that about the Bible is because of how absolutely, unequivocally honest it is. It is the most honest book in the whole world. And because it is the truth. Because it is the perfect revelation of God. And I say that, it is the perfect revelation of God. Um, and more evidence of that fact is shown in the very next verses. Um, look at verses 9 to 13. And as they were coming down from the mountain... Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? <laughs> All right, I have to just pause there for one second. What are you talking about? First of all, you just saw Elijah on the mountain. First of all. Second of all, God the Father just said, listen to him. And the first thing that Jesus says to them is, tell no one the vision until I have risen from the dead. And the first thing the disciples do is change the subject? Risen from the dead. And they say, but what about Elijah? I thought he was supposed to come first. Like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, wh what happens? What happened there, Lord? Like, instead of, I, oh, I don't know. Oh, Lord, your father said we should listen to you. I'm sorry we haven't listened to you. Tell us more about what it means that you will rise from the dead. You know, that sounds like it's an important thing that you keep talking about. Maybe we shouldn't keep changing the subject every time you bring it up. That's how I know that this book is the truth, all right? Because if it wasn't, it would have been written the way I just said it, right? No, but it honestly records the, the like, just the spiritual lack of understanding of these men at that time. Total spiritual lack of understanding. Like, hey, I, I heard that Malachi, I think it was, said that Elijah has to come first. And then we see just the infinite patience of Jesus where it says, he answered. Look at that. Verse 11. I could just do a whole sermon just on that. He answered. Because Christ has the answer. Christ is the answer. He answers even their inane questions. He answered them. He could have just ignored them. You see, as a matter of fact, Christ gave no answer to Pontius Pilate when Pilate was questioning him. No answer. He was silent. But here, he answers because he is meek and mild and loves these disciples so much and sees them as sheep that need a shepherd. And he's patient with them. He's kind to them. He has mercy on them. He answered. If I was in that position, I mean, how often I am in that position. When, when I'll say, listen to me, and the person still isn't listening, and then they come and change the subject, I'll just shake my head. I don't even want to answer anymore. No, Jesus answered. Elijah does come. 
and he'll restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. Listen now. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. What is he talking about yet again? Gently, meekly, mildly, drawing them back to the cross, showing them that the cross is the way. The Son of Man must suffer at their hands. He's turning them. They're going all this way, that way, off the path, every different direction. He's turning them back on. The cross is the way. I must suffer. Do you understand? Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. That's also so telling. What should they have understood? That he was speaking to them mostly about himself and what was going to happen to him. Yes, John the Baptist was the Elijah who was to come. For those who are able to receive it. He came in the spirit of Elijah. He turned the hearts of the fathers back to their children. He brought spiritual renewal and revival back to the land. That did happen. But listen to me, the Son of Man must suffer at the hands of wicked men and die and be buried and rise again. That is the center of the gospel. They needed to know it. They needed to have that in the center of their lives. They needed to believe it. Yet again, Jesus emphasizes his impending death. But perhaps even more difficult, that that, that, that was even more difficult for Peter to believe after what he had just seen. You think about that. Jesus is talking about how he has to die. But what did Peter just now see? The glory of Christ. What do you mean you have to die? See, you're proving to me right now by showing me your glory. You're proving to me. You're not going to die. You're going to set up your kingdom right now, Lord. He couldn't get it through his head. I understand it. I understand it because I would be the same way. It was more difficult for Peter, James, and John to believe after what they had just seen, but eventually they would believe it when what Christ said would happen would come to pass. Charles Wesley, who wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing, he wrote these words too. Hark how all the welkin rings. Glory to the King of kings. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. See, he could write that many years later. 17 centuries after the fact. Because the apostles, those three men who were up there on the mountain, they did come to realize what Christ was talking about. They did come to see that Christ's mission was to die and rise again, that by dying and rising again, it would pay for the sins of his people and give them a living and enduring hope. God and sinners would be reconciled. That's how Wesley wrote those lyrics. That's why. And praise God for that. Because that's how we have our peace. I want to just finish by saying this. Peter wrote about this experience on the mountaintop. In 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 16, he said this. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory... That's what he's saying. That cloud, that bright cloud, is the majestic glory. And a voice came out of the cloud and testified, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to what he says in verse 18. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you would do well to pay attention. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> what did you say, Peter? 
We have something more sure, that is more sure than what? Than his own experience. He says, I, I had this experience. I was on the mountain. I heard the voice for myself. I saw the majestic glory. I saw the glory of Christ revealed. I saw it, but I have something even more sure. And you know what it is? It's this right here. The words of God revealed in the Bible. This is more sure than any experience that we could ever have. Because this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The prophetic Word. It's more than our experience. We can have experiences if we eat a bad piece of corned beef. We can have an experience if we take a drug. Our experiences are not reliable. This, this is what's reliable. I don't care what anyone else says. The Word says it. It's true. Amen. And it's been true. It's perennially true. It's always true. It's the words of God. And then Peter says, we have this even more sure word of prophecy. And then he says, to which you will do well to pay attention. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know how he could say that? Because he learned. Here is the, the king of not paying attention. And then on Pentecost, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And his life was completely changed. And he paid attention. And he understood what Christ was saying. And his life was completely changed. Do you know him? He says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's what we have in Christ. For those who believe, our living hope is that in a day very soon, sooner than we think, sooner than any of us think, we will see Christ as He really is, face to face. Will you see Him as a friend or as an enemy? God forbid that it's as an enemy. You do not want to see Christ as an enemy. Come to him now. He is willing to receive you. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the revelation of your glory. Yet again, we see how beautiful and wonderful you truly are. Thank you for this testimony of what the disciples saw and they recorded it. They wrote it down for our benefit. And we also would have even further confirmation of the identity of Christ and the mission of Christ. And we would worship you, Lord. Be with us now. May the morning star rise in our hearts. May we turn to you and have everlasting life and peace in Jesus' name. Amen.